The SBLG Annual Forum Segment Keynote Conversation. Lieutenant Governor Eleni Kunalakis with SVLG CEO Ahmad Thomas is brought to you by United. Enjoy. I am the proud chair of the Silicon Valley Leadership Group. I am also the husband of a lady named Danielle who said I needed to grow a beard for our Halloween costumes on Saturday. So I apologize for not being cleanly shaven today. Uh, in the past year, the Silicon Valley Leadership Group has focused on three key areas of, of work. Business competitiveness, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and sustainability. And our conversation today is going to touch on all of those topics. We're going to kick things off with a keynote conversation on California competitiveness with our Lieutenant Governor, Eleni Kunalakis. We're very, very excited to have the Lieutenant Governor here with us today. She's going to be in a conversation with our CEO, Ahmad Thomas, um, to discuss how we can promote both inclusive growth and a competitive business climate, which I think are very, very important topics to our entire state and certainly our region. We are honored to have the Lieutenant Governor here today. And now please welcome uh, our Lieutenant Governor and Ahmad to the stage. They're Niners. <laughs> uh, Lieutenant Governor, it's great to see you. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, and thank you, Jed. He's been such a great uh, supporter as our chairman here at SVLG. We'll dive right into some questions about California competitiveness and the business climate here. I think we've got a text line as well. If you've got some questions, text them over and we'll ensure that we get to them at the end of our about 20 minute Q&A. So the first question, Lieutenant Governor, is talking about where things are going with the economy in California. You have many business executives here. We follow the volatility that we've seen, clearly a lot of uneven economic indicators. Are we approaching a recession? Is California prepared to weather one if that is the case near or midterm? Well, Ahmad, first of all, I just want to thank you and everyone at the Silicon Valley Leadership Forum for having me. It's always great to be with this group. I think it's pretty clear that in terms of trade-like organizations, um, nothing is as uh, impactful as this one here in Silicon Valley. Well, thank you. So it's it's great to be here because I, whenever I do come, I always learn something um, from your leadership, from your membership, uh, and so it's it's wonderful to be here with you. Um, so you're right. I think that um, it's been clear for some time that the extraordinary economic gains and these super budgets of the last two years, these, these super surpluses, $65 billion two years ago, $100 billion last year. And to give you context, the state budget was $300 billion last year. So that's $100 billion of that 300 was surplus money. I mean, these were extraordinary times. Um, but even as the governor and the legislature were programming those funds, at the time, there was clear recognition uh, that it wasn't going to last forever. And so when I pieced apart and in my way advocated for elements of it, um, what was clear is that budget resiliency was the single most important priority of those two years of budget surpluses. That means uh, re, re um, filling the coffers of the rainy day fund, which are now at their statutory limit. Uh, it meant um, that 93% of the spending was one-time spending. Uh, it meant that um, the bond uh, obligations, many of those that could be paid down were in order to be able to increase our bonding capacity in the state going forward. That includes uh, pension bonds? Pension. Paying down pensions, extraordinary tens of billions of dollars above what was statutorily required because you know we do have statutory requirements for paying down pensions as a result of an initiative several years ago. But even beyond that, the governor and the legislature, and I think I'm looking right at <laughs> Mark Berman. Hi, Mark. So we have a member Assembly of the legislature, <laughs> Assembly member here. And by the way, I think I saw Diane Pappen, who was on her way to becoming a member of the Assembly here as well. Uh, there she is. But, um, but there was a real 
recognition of the importance of investing in our economic strength to be able to weather uh, whatever the storms were. And there's one other uh, critical priority of the programming of those budgets that, that I should mention that maybe you in this room were affected, maybe your employees were uh, affected by it, but we spent about $26 billion in, um, in efforts to go directly to help working families of California um, shore up their own finances and help them through the pandemic. So about $26 billion went directly into California households in the form of paying down rent obligations during um, COVID. I mean, many people had their entire back rent. If they lost their job and they weren't working, they had their entire back rent covered by the state government. Uh, the Golden State stimulus uh, funds that went into pe people's pockets, we've never seen anything like it before, but the state was actually using that budget surplus essentially as a rebate for families who needed it the most. And so by being able to ensure that coming out of COVID, People didn't have all of their savings depleted, but in fact were able to be helped through. That helps as well going into an economic downturn. So what I would say to your question of, we had this big bust and we may be facing a serious downturn, is that from what I saw sitting um, in my office as Lieutenant Governor and as the technically the President of the Senate was a lot, and, and frankly, though I'm not an economist, as a member of the governor's economic advisory council, is a great attention to preparing for a downturn. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's certainly, whether it be uh, CEO of Goldman Sachs, Dave Solomon, we've seen other tech leaders come out and speak to the concern about where we might see the economy going near or midterm. What you're sharing is that the, the sense you've heard in Sacramento is a, a recognition that's similar and action taken right. during those surplus years. Again, replenishing rainy day fund, making sure California households are able to be resilient. Uh, and then we didn't talk about our investment in a clean energy future, but that creates great opportunity in the future as well. Right, right. Well, I wanna talk about what makes California and Silicon Valley competitive. Then I also wanna to touch on this texodus or exodus or withdrawal or whatever you wanna call it mm -hmm. about companies purportedly, or in some cases, leaving the state. But let's take the competitiveness questions. What, what is the core, or what are the core elements of competitiveness in Silicon Valley or in California, in your estimation? Well, I'd like to just kind of draw the lens back a little on that question. Um, as Lieutenant Governor, I spend a lot of time working in the space of public higher education. And that is something that is, I think, under-recognized in terms of our competitiveness. You know, we are a $3.3 trillion economy, about the size of India. We are 40 million people, the largest uh, state by population in the country. The average of um, immigration for the United States is 14%, but in California, it's 27%. Mm -hmm. And as we have, in my words, benefited from the generous immigration policies of the United States over the years, California has opened up our doors to public higher education in our state. So 40 million population, two and a half million students are enrolled just in public higher education in the state of California. 37% of them are the first in their family to go to college. So this is this massive conveyor belt of talent that has driven the California economy for a very long time through booms and busts, which we've always had in this state. We are different than other states in the United States for a variety of reasons. But this one element of it, in my view, is what always allows us to have a competitive edge, an innovative edge, and continue to recharge our economy regardless uh, of what comes at us. Right, and I think what's unique for Silicon Valley, and I've heard this uh, even back when you were ambassador of Hungary, 
uh, the education, when we talk about the research universities here, uh, venture capital, I, I see the godfather Ken Coleman over there, venture capital and access to venture capital. We talk about the partnerships with our companies through organizations like SVLG. You have all of this coming together that creates an ecosystem, an innovation ecosystem that's very hard to duplicate. Now, I don't believe there's a zero sum game where we see Austin or Boston or other places across the world doing well. But to this question of companies leaving the state, yeah. is that real in your estimation? How are you and other leaders in Sacramento viewing that? So first of all, thank you for noting, Ahmed, that if the biotech industry in Boston starts to um, grow, that that's not a bad thing for us as Americans, right? We shouldn't say, well, just because there was a period of time that if you were gonna be in biotech, you had to be in South San Francisco because that's where the money was and the innovation and you know, all the companies that were pioneering this. Um, I, I agree. I think that particularly with distance learning or distance um, working, remote working as well, it was inevitable that some of that would happen. But I really want to be clear. We should absolutely care if companies leave California. We don't want companies to leave, particularly if they don't want to leave because they feel that they're inhibited or that there are too many challenges to be able to stay. Um, so I have an MBA from UC Berkeley and I do everything I can in my capacity. And I believe that there is housed within, certainly within the, the administration and go biz, the intention to try to help make sure that if companies are having challenges, that were there to try to help. But, but I want to say this. What we found when we started looking into this, and we did, most certainly, two years ago, or almost two years ago, when we had that kind of rash of announcements, the Charles Schwab announcement, of course, Elon Musk tweeting and all that, we absolutely wanted to look at this and, and, and ask the, these questions, because about 1% of California personal income taxpayers and along with large corporations, together cover about half of the California, you know, fill the coffers of our general fund. Yeah, we've got a lot of that of the in the room here today. Thank you yeah. all very much um, for your contributions to that. And it's our responsibility, by the way, to make sure that we do invest those dollars in, in the right way. Um, but what we found is that the single largest driver of people leaving California was the cost of housing. So in May, the housing price, and this is where I come from. I was 18 years working in housing development in Sacramento. In May, our median home price in California peaked at $900,000 for a single family home. I mean, this is just unbelievable. You hear that maybe for the Bay Area and you say, wow, that's a lot. But then you factor in the, the rest of the state and the parts of the state where you wouldn't expect that, that, that prices would, would have increased that much. $900,000 in May. At around the same time, you're looking at median home prices in Texas and Florida that are in the 300s. So that makes a really, really big difference. And, and there is no question if you're following what's going on in the legislature right now, the state is working very hard to advance policies where local governments are still what I call, to use an old uh, term from the Marines, the tip of the spear, but the state can provide the thrust to just get more housing online in our state. Um, that is without question, uh, I, I, in my opinion, a, a big part of the challenge. Um, but I also want to say this, you know, if you moved to Texas two years ago and you're looking around and you're like, wait a minute, it's not as beautiful as California. California is stunningly beautiful. That is a fact. Okay, yes. it is a fact, <laughs> documented fact. But you're also looking at costs that you might not have expected, like property taxes being very, very high there, whereas California has Prop 13. People don't always necessarily weigh that in. 
And you may also say you're a woman executive and you and your husband are starting a family and you have an entopic pregnancy and you go to the doctor and the doctor may not be able to save your life if your life is threatened. And you have to figure out how you get out real quick in order to be able to get the medical care you need. Not so rosy in places that are advancing policies like that, which by the way, aren't just contrary to the way that Californians feel about the issue of choice. It's contrary to the way the country feels about choice. And yet you're seeing states that are having these radicalized political movements that are driving for irrational kinds of policies that affect people's lives. So I think all in all, California is looking pretty good. But, but let, me just, let me just say again, we cannot take anything for granted. We absolutely must recognize that we are a democracy with a free market economy and innovation that comes up through co competition and a free market is very, very important, not just to the California economy, the US economy and to any successful economy. Well, well come on, yeah. people. No, I'm just, yeah, okay. What? Also. And for my team, if there are any audience questions, please uh, bring them to me. I have two more questions for you, Lieutenant Governor. I really appreciate how you frame that because we believe Silicon Valley is the epicenter of the global economy. We believe our innovation infrastructure is robust, but we also acknowledge that the cost of doing business here and that cost benefit dynamic is perhaps at the most challenging place it's ever been. And so, as a business executive yourself, mm -hmm. many business leaders in the audience, what do you have to say or what guidance might you give us about the cost of doing business here? What I would say is that California is different than the rest of the country. We are the fifth largest economy in the world and evidently there are some numbers coming out that, are, that are, we're nipping at Germany's heels. So this is not an ordinary place. And we can't do an apples to apples comparison. Yeah, the cost of business is doing high. Yes, it is incumbent upon us to make sure that hurdles to business that, that are not useful for very important reasons, you know, whether they're protecting our environment or dealing with the fact that we are number one in the country for income inequality, and we have more people living at or below the poverty line than most of you might realize. And we're not gonna let people not be able to put a roof over their family's heads and food on the table and have those basic needs. And it's a real challenge here. And so it is incumbent upon us as government to be able to make that case and say, look, we're gonna do everything we can to give you the the best possible workforce through our system of public higher education. We need you to be with us, that we need to take care of our people at the basic level. We are going to invest in our infrastructure. We are going to invest in the economies of the future, which if we have a couple minutes to talk about, about the um, green economy and the carbon-free energy future of our state and what we're doing to get there, I, I'd love to chat about that. Um, but this is a unique place in the world. And so what I always say is, you have a problem that you think is fixable relative to doing business, come to us. My doors are open, go biz, the governor's office of business and economic development, which is headed up by the way, uh, by Dee Dee Myers. Oh, we love Dee Dee. You, yeah. you, okay, so she's been here. She's doing incredible work in this space. And again, I have a vigorously nodding assemblyman here and soon to be assemblywoman here. Talk to them, go to them, give them the support that they need to help make sure that your issues are heard in Sacramento. Well, thank you. We'll take you up on that, Lieutenant Governor, certainly. Uh, and I'll end on a question about innovation and looking forward. Uh, the themes today, we're talking about business competitiveness, sustainable and inclusive growth. So if we look at how we can support the next Amazon, the next Google here in Silicon Valley or in California, what comments would you have about how you view that in your role as Lieutenant Governor, as a leader in Sacramento, and also your comments around the clean tech and clean energy economy, how you're supporting 
that growth? So, you know, there, obviously technology spans a whole spectrum, and what a new, the next Amazon or Google needs may be very different than, you know, what the next Bloom Energy needs or the next um, Netflix needs. Um, but I do just want to underscore what we do in this state with our system of public higher education. The U.S. News and World, uh, U, US News and World Report's um, list of all the um, top universities in the country, when they list public universities of the top 10 public universities in the United States of America, California universities occupy six of those spots. Oh. So we are really trying to make sure that our people drive the next generation of unicorns and, and, and the future of, of the companies that are most likely to be able to attract venture capital uh, funds. Um, the, the, the piece though, the, and thank you very much for giving me the floor to talk about this. So um, I was the United States ambassador to Hungary and I spent a lot of time working with the Hungarian government and other governments in Europe on the issue of energy security. And there's a big battle going on right there. You certainly might have seen um, that the IRA, um, which has historic investments by the US government into a carbon-free energy future and combating climate change was actually not expected to pass. Um, I heard some remarks um, from a representative of the German gov government saying this could harm the German economy because it's requiring the onshoring of a lot of the manufacturing that's going to go along with the, the uh, uh, awarding of all of the grants around the IRA. But you look at the historic investment of the IRA and then you couple it with $54 billion that the, that the California governor and legislature through our budgeting process has allocated for um, combating climate change and transitioning to a clean energy future. I, I spent a very large part of my time representing the governor in the state as our representative for international affairs and trade. Everybody is coming here. They wanna know who are our companies and how can they get, either invest in California companies that are going to target the fact that, again, we are the number one consumer market in the United States, right? That if our 2035 goal of all zero emission vehicles being sold, have to be sold in our state, people are coming here to meet this market. They know we're serious and they know that we have laid a foundation for companies to rise up in this space, and also for us to meet their needs by doing things like extending some of the tax credit programs um, that allowed Tesla to um, uh, to be born here. Couldn't, couldn't have happened. I mean, Elon Musk is not particularly appreciative, but nobody asked for gratitude, right? What we did was we had tax credit programs for R&D, that allowed him to be able to invest in the research and development for Tesla. And then we had uh, rebate programs for people to buy the cars. And then we had a general public that was very interested in doing their part uh, to take advantage of this new technology and not pollute the air because half of our greenhouse gases come from the transportation sector. That is the perfect storm that created helped create, helped support the, or leverage what we could bring to the table to his innovative abilities and the risks that he and the venture capital companies took that has now led the way in a total transformation of what we're looking at in the transportation sector. That groundwork was just laid in last year's budget and in the budget of the year before. I really encourage you all to look at the opportunities that are being created as a result of those investments. Um, and we are catching the ire of oil companies because they're jacking up our cost of gasoline in this state with these mysterious costs. You know, just for the record, 
California taxes contribute 26 cents per gallon. That doesn't account for the fact that the cost of gas at the pump in California is in some cases $2, $3 more than some of the other states in the country. So some analysts say that you could expand that 26% all costs of doing business combined to about 75 cents. We're still getting a special price. And so we are at a moment where either we are going to transition to the kinds of energy, and, and by the way, it's not just solar and wind. There are all kinds of other things that, there's a company down in Southern California that's looking at fusion. There's you know, advances in, in, in battery storage that can help leverage uh, the, um, uh, the solar and the wind that's either developed or on its way. Um, but this is a moment where, as a planet, we're either going to do it or we're not. And California, it, it, if, it, if, if it happens, it is going to be because of the people in the state taking advantage of the groundwork that the state and federal government are laying to leverage the private sector in order to get us there. So it's really now up to all of you. Well, I'll, I'll use my purview here as moderator in, oh, here we go. Wow, we had, we had a smart audience here. This is, uh, then we'll take the first question. How can the state, this is from the audience, how can the state continue to support innovators during an economic downturn? Well, so I mentioned, again, this, you know, two years of extraordinary budget surpluses and what those priorities are and the fact that 93% is one-time spending. One-time spending is actually spent over a little bit longer period of time. And the, um, the laying of that foundation for innovation and tax rebates, particularly for California companies, I think that is the best way that we can help is essentially uh, just what I said. But again, also, um, if there are people, and we sometimes see if they're feeling like this isn't the time to start their business, it's a time to go back to school. And I spent a lot of my time trying to figure out how can we make sure that our community colleges are very much open for job for reskilling and job skilling, and making sure that um, young innovators who want to go back and get more skills can do that, and frankly, uh, do it tuition free. Well, this will be our last question. I don't know if it's my staff who planted this, or maybe our assembly member over here, but I'll, I'll go ahead and read it. Lieutenant Governor, do you think the Bay Area receives its fair share of funding? for climate, public health, and other goods and service needs. Give me thumbs up, thumbs down, or somewhere in the middle. What's your answer, Mark? We should always have more. Yeah, well, no, That's we're, the we answer. Are, we're, yeah, thumbs down. We need um, more. This is, a, this is a very special place in the world. And when, I was, um, when I was in Hungary, gosh, it was a long time ago now. I left, um, finished my posting nine years ago. And everywhere I went, everywhere. It was, I, I went to Afghanistan several times when I was serving overseas. I was down in Kosovo and Sarajevo and of course would spend a lot of time elsewhere in, uh, in Europe and in Central Europe and everybody wanted to know how can we have a Silicon Valley here. You, you can't just snap your fingers. It's a lot of factors that have come together to create this extremely special place and very important place. And so making sure, first and foremost, that we know what your issues are, that we know what your challenges are, and that we have that expertise from you carried back to the state level so that we can respond is very important. Uh, is, is Gina Pappen here too? Yeah, is Gina. So Gina Pappen on Millbury City Council. Uh, is also on the Regional Transportation right. uh, Authority, and she will jump up and down and yell 
uh, more money, more resources um, for our transportation infrastructure in this region. But I think what she'd also tell you is that it's really important that all these different authorities and regional um, uh, transportation agencies work to, together more carefully so that the resources that we do have are better, are better programmed right. in order to be able to, um, you know, I, I, wanna, I wanna say my one transportation uh, story. I, I, I certainly knew enough to know how important um, California trade and investment is in California, but when I took this portfolio on for the governor, um, I was trying to quantify how important trade and investment is to our state and that one out of five California jobs comes from foreign direct investment, international trade, and tourism. Um, that we have one of the busiest land border crossings in the world uh, between California and Mexico. I'm actually going to Mexico City tomorrow. On Monday, we're signing a cost-sharing agreement for another border crossing at Otay Mesa II. And then on Monday, on Tuesday, I'll be with Pete Buttigieg on our border, um, talking about the federal investment in those, in those border crossings because it is so important to our economy and the US economy. 40% of all the containerized goods coming in to the United States come through the port of Long Beach and, uh, and Los Angeles, and not to mention, of course, our ports up here in Northern California. And my favorite trade statistic of all is that Every year, through the port of Wainimi, who most people up north have never even heard of, every year 3.3 billion bananas come through the port of Wainimi. That is 10 bananas for every man, woman, and child in the United States of America. <laughs> Somebody once said, if you have a banana west of the Mississippi, came through the port of Wainimi. Yeah. But the, the logistics, the manufacturing, California is number one in manufacturing. The, the warehousing operations that we see in the Inland Empire in Southern California, we are a powerhouse economy in this state. But Silicon Valley is the brain trust of innovation. And what I would actually like to leave you with, because now I see the numbers are going up instead of down. <laughs> um, what I would really like to leave you all, all with is, you know, Technology is changing absolutely everything. Absolutely everything. It's touching all of our lives, not just how we work and how we live, but what we think of ourselves as human beings. And just as we have done our part to lay this foundation for the next wave through an economic downturn, because that was one time spending sitting in all these coffers, along with the IRA, to give you the the ability to leverage this state's investment, taxpayers' investment toward innovation, that you also think long-term of what our societies are gonna look like. You know, I think I saw Peter Thiel's trying to get dual citizenship now with Malta, is that right? Yeah. Um, I, it's a beautiful place, half a million people. But the fact of the matter is that America has always been the place that people come to in order to be safe, in order to be able to live a life without fear. And I would, I guess, leave you with the thought of challenging all of you to think about what happens here that allows all of us in this beautiful state of California from Greece or from anywhere else in the world that your parents, your family may have come from because we are a majority minority state in the state of California. What are we going to be able to do now and in the future in order to continue to be the safe haven that we are for generations of, of people and, and to be able to provide security, stability, and of course, incredible opportunity. Well, let's give a round of applause. What a wonderful closing. And thank you so much, Lieutenant Governor. Please see us, please see our leaders in the audience as partners to support your important work. Thank you. Thank you, Ahmed. Yeah. Thank you, everybody.